Seeing is believing, but seeing isn't necessarily understanding. You can't always tell what an ancient artifact is or what it was used for just by looking at it. In some cases, you still can't tell what it is or what it was used for even after an extended period of study. There's something a little mysterious about all the artifacts you're about to see in this video, so prepare to be puzzled. Some of the earliest works of art created by our ancient ancestors are representations of the world they saw around them. As an example, here's a 4,400-year-old wooden snake carving from Finland. The unusual artifact was discovered by archaeologists working at a site close to Jarvinsuo in the southwest of the country. The life-size snake, which is around 20 inches long, is a relic of the Neolithic Stone Age. Nothing like it has ever been found in the country before its discovery in June 2021, so archaeologists view it as a new insight into the ritual imagery and artistic expression of the people of the era. The Stone Age rock art of Northern Europe often depicts humans holding snake-shaped rocks, but this is the first example of such an artifact being discovered for real. The area would have been wetlands 4,000 years ago, and so snakes would have been a common sight for the people living nearby. The significance of the snake as a symbol is unknown. It's likely that it would have been wielded like a staff and perhaps thought to have magical powers, and may have belonged to a shaman. If you were to go to a bar and ask for a pint of beer, you'd be served your beverage of choice in a glass that would probably look a lot like this. This isn't a humble pint glass, though. It is, in fact, the Warring States Crystal Glass of China, and it's over 2,200 years old. The stunning crystal artifact was found in a Warring States period mausoleum tomb in Hangzhou in 1990 and immediately caught the eye of archaeologists because of its close resemblance to a modern drinking vessel. You'd be a lot more upset if you dropped this glass than you would if you dropped a pint glass, though, because it's made from very high-quality natural crystal. It's considered so valuable that it's one of only 64 artifacts that are legally prohibited from ever leaving China, not even for international exhibitions. The identity of the tomb's owner was never determined, which makes the history of the glass a little mysterious. No object like it from this era has ever been discovered, and we can't be certain of its purpose. It's tempting to dismiss it as a drinking vessel for someone of immense wealth, but why go to the trouble of making such a thing out of crystal? The words ancient curse rarely have positive implications. But curses weren't always written with negative intent in ancient times. Take the Pella Curse Tablet, for example. Despite the scary name, archaeologists believe it's a so-called love curse written by a woman named Dagina, who wanted to make a man called Dionysophon fall in love with her. It's written in the Doric Greek dialect on a lead scroll and is roughly 2,400 years old. The artifact was found in Pella, Macedonia in 1986. Aside from being a fascinating insight into the romantic lives of everyday people 2,400 years ago, the fact that it's written in Doric Greek indicates that the ancient Macedonian language was, in fact, a dialect of Northwestern Greek rather than a language in its own right. In writing the curse, Dagina was very specific about her wishes. She wanted Dionysophon to marry her rather than a woman named Fatima, and also wanted to grow old along Dionysophon, unless she returned to dig up the scroll and unroll it. It's interesting that even though she wanted to steal Dionysophon away from another woman, she still wanted to give herself a get-out clause in case she changed her mind. In 2016, art experts and historians claim to have solved what was once described as the world's biggest small mystery. Their claim relates to a 500-year-old set of boxwood miniature carvings that have long confounded academics and scholars. The representations of heaven, hell, and life on Earth carved in intricate detail on the artifacts are as confusing as they are impressive. They were the must-have item of their era. King Henry VIII of England carried one around everywhere, which led to them becoming seen as a status symbol. 
They appear to have been cherished for around 20 years, and then they disappear from history. There are no contemporary records of who made them or how. We can't even recreate them using modern methods. Only 135 examples have survived to the present day. 30 of them were studied by the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2016, revealing that each of the pieces was created by making a circular piece of boxwood, bisecting it, slicing it into thin disks, carving the disks, and then reassembling them so neatly that the seams are invisible. The wood comes from Belgium, and amazingly, all of the work on every piece appears to have been carried out by the same person. When that person died, nobody could take over the work, thus explaining their sudden disappearance. The Spirit Pond rune stones are enormously controversial artifacts. If taken at face value, they appear to suggest that the Holy Grail was brought to North America in ancient times. That's precisely why so many archaeologists and historians write them off as a hoax. The stones were supposedly found by Walter J. Elliott near Spirit Pond in Phippsburg, Maine, USA in 1971. There are three stones in total, two covered in runic inscriptions and the third showing what appears to be a map. Elliott took the stones to Bath Maritime Museum, where they were identified as Norse runes by museum director Harold Brown. For the sake of balance, we should point out that Harvard professor of Scandinavian languages, Einar Hagen, also examined the stones and immediately dismissed them as fraudulent. More recently, though, a succession of reputable academics have warmed to the idea of them being genuinely Scandinavian in origin and perhaps connected to a Viking voyage across the sea in 1405. Forensic geologist Scott Walter goes farther, claiming the stones tell the story of the Knights Templar fleeing persecution in Europe and bringing the Holy Grail with them. In this version of history, the Holy Grail is the living bloodline of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. Walter's theory is probably wrong, but maybe it's time someone gave us a definitive answer about the authenticity of the stones. Since we're talking about hard to decipher ancient stones, let's check out this 13,800 year old engraving. It was found at the archeological site of Mole del Salt, Spain in 2013. And if archaeologists are correct in their interpretation of it, it's a very primitive map. To be more specific, they think it shows the position of huts in a hunter-gatherer campsite. That would involve a greater degree of site planning than we usually associate with the hunter-gatherers of almost 14,000 years ago. The Schist slab is engraved with seven semicircle shapes, which have been interpreted as huts based on their shape and proportions. That might make this Paleolithic inscription the first representation of a human social group ever found in Europe. Quite why an ancient artist would want to make the inscription is unknown. It could be a simple case of a bored person idly sketching the campsite as it appeared to them in that particular moment. Alternatively, it could be a plan for the ideal formation of camps and huts, which the tribe carried around with them from location to location. In either case, it implies that camps and huts stayed in one place for longer than most historians currently believe. The Middleham Jewel was found by amateur metal detectorist Ted Seaton as he walked along a horse trail close to Middleham Castle, Yorkshire, England in 1985. It was a discovery that changed his life. The jewel is actually a gold pendant from the 15th century and may once also have been a reliquary though its internal cavity was empty save for a few scraps of fabric when it was found. The pendant is set with a blue sapphire and engraved on each side with religious scenes, including the crucifixion. Such is the elaborate nature of the piece that some historians feel it may have belonged to Anne Neville, the wife of Richard III. The blue of the sapphire, along with the presence of several female saints among the inscriptions, may suggest that the jewel was a gift given to assist with the process of childbirth. When Ted was granted permission to sell the jewel in 1986, he received 1.4 million pounds for it, but that wasn't the end of the story. The British government refused permission for the jewel to be exported to its foreign buyer and raised further funds for the Yorkshire Museum to buy it instead, eventually acquiring it for 2.5 million pounds. 
Could this shattered vase help us to solve the mystery of what happened to the ancient Maya? Some historians believe so. This is the Comcom vase, which was found in an ancient royal palace in Belize. It's elaborately decorated with hieroglyphs, many of which tell the story of a king of Comcom, who apparently performed a frog-like dance after important military victories. Archaeologists from Texas's Baylor University, which was responsible for the discovery, say the vase comes from the very early 9th century. Only about 60% of the vase has been found and put back together. The 9th century is of vital importance when trying to understand Mayan history because this was when their civilization began to collapse for unknown reasons. Among the partially translated tales told by the hieroglyphs on the vase is one of the Comcom king leading a successful military raid on the Mayan territory of Yaxa. Another tale talks of the leader of Tikal being sent into exile. From these short excerpts, it appears that the Mayan civilization collapsed not in one fell swoop, but after a series of attacks from surrounding territories accompanied by the droughts and famines we were already aware of. We shouldn't read too much into 60% of just one single vase, of course, but it's an interesting insight. For hundreds of years, the biblical seal of Solomon was thought to be a myth. Said to have belonged to the ancient king of Israel, the artifact is said to have many magical powers, including the ability for its owner to speak to animals. The magical powers are obviously mythical, but in 2017 we found out that the artifact might be real. In late 2017, Turkish police arrested a suspected tomb raider and searched his property in Amasya province. There they found this ancient bronze seal. They also found a golden bull figurine, five solid gold tablets, and a bronze charm. But it's the seal that caused the most excitement. The Bible tells us that the name of God was engraved on Solomon's ring, allowing him to summon and control demons. Arabic legends say that Solomon received the ring from the heavens, but is less specific about its powers. If the seal really had such powers, the smuggler would presumably have used them to fend off the police. Confirming that this ancient seal is the same one that's referenced in the Bible is likely to be impossible but it's of the right age and the right design. The Turkish police are yet to report any breakthroughs in animal communication. The mosaic of Rehob is historically significant for many reasons. Also known as both the Bereda of the Boundaries and the Tel Rahav inscription, it features the longest text inscription of any mosaic in Israel and is also the oldest known Talmudic text of any kind. It was found on the floor of an ancient synagogue in Tel Rahav in 1973 and is thought to be 1,700 years old. Unlike most mosaics of both the era and the area, it features no symmetrical designs and very little in the way of ornamentation. Instead, it contains a very long list of fruit and vegetables subject to tithing in 18 towns in the surrounding areas. It's not necessarily a fascinating thing to read, but it has helped historians to understand how Jewish laws of the time affected farmers and provided further detail about the historical geography of Palestine during the late Roman era. The text also delineates the boundaries of the land of Israel in what might be the first attempt to establish the country's legal status after the end of Babylonian captivity. You have to be a solicitor with a flair for ancient law to understand parts of it, but it's incredible to see it all laid out as a mosaic rather than a scroll or a manuscript. The only thing we know with any certainty about the Picts is that they lived in Scotland for over 1,000 years. Everything else is guesswork. They left very little in the way of monuments and had no written language. We don't even know the collective term they used to refer to themselves. We get the word Picts from the Romans. Because of the lack of direct evidence of their existence, archaeologists tend to jump excitedly into any Pictish relic they can find. Here's one that turned up in 2018. Archaeologists hard at work on the remote Scottish island of Rose in the Orkney Islands found this ancient stone anvil used by a Pictish metalsmith approximately 1,500 years ago. Thanks to a combination of heat, dirt, and grease, his handprint is still visible on the stone. 
It's the only known Pictish handprint in existence and feels like a personal connection with a civilization that's long gone. The imprints of his feet and knees have also been identified in the area around the stone. Remarkably, his workshop was underground and would have been pitch black were it not for the light given off by the red-hot metals he worked with. That probably sounds dangerous, and it would have been, but it may also have helped him visually assess the temperature of the metals he worked with. The mythical figure known as Roland appears in the folklore and legends of several European nations. Aspects of the tale change from country to country, but he's most commonly said to have been a mighty medieval warrior. In France, he's said to have been the nephew of Charlemagne. That might even be true. A figure that historians believe might have been inspired by tales of Roland fought in the Battle of Roncevaux Pass in 778. In every description of Roland, he carries his mighty sword, Durandal, with him. French legends say that he was given the sword by Charlemagne himself, who received it from an angel. The Italians say that Roland inherited the sword from Hector, the legendary hero of Troy. It's tempting to write the whole thing off as fiction, but there's the small matter of the sword that's embedded in the wall above the doorway of Chapelle de Notre Dame in Rocamadour, France. This weapon is definitely very old and is consistent with the design of 8th century blades. Could it be Durandal? We'll probably never know. The chapel guards the sword fiercely and has never allowed any testing to be carried out on it. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.